Okay, thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, a short reading, uh, two readings from two translations that I've done. The first is uh, from an upcoming translation uh, by, of a novel by He Yang Pian. Uh, she's the author of The Hole and City of Ash and Red. Uh, it was mentioned probably a couple times in my bio. Um, the book is called The Law of Lines. It's coming out in spring of next year. Um, so to give just a little bit of background on the book, I kind of consider it her take on a crime novel. She, if you've read her other book, she does different, she tackles different genres like horror, or dystopian fiction. And, and this one, I, she kind of cringed when I said it was a crime novel, but oh well. <laughs> so all you really need to know for the excerpt in terms of background is one of the main characters, Seo. Um, at the very beginning of the book, she learns that her father has died in a gas explosion at home, and she becomes obsessed with this man named Suho, a debt collector who was harassing her father. Uh, and so this, uh, I'm reading chapter 12, which is a bit far into the book, um, but it's, well, you'll see. So I'll go ahead and start chapter 12. When does evil intent become evil itself? Is it evil simply to imagine and harbor an idea? Does it begin when a thought is put into action? And if that action fails, then did evil never exist to begin with? If indeed there was no evil, then is it okay to allow bad intentions to make you change your behavior, move to a new place, change your lifestyle? Does that mean that evil thoughts are no worse than a daydream, a mere fantasy? Even fantasies and daydreams can sometimes alter reality. In Seo's case, when did she first harbor ill will? Was it when she heard that man's name from Detective Kim? Was it when she saw her father wrapped in bandages? Or when she never got to show him how she looked in the purple coat that he bought for her? Perhaps it began the day after she'd spent the night alone in the charred hole of number 157. Or maybe it started much later than that, such as the moment she set her chopsticks down, unable to finish eating the ramen that refused to taste the same as the ramen her father had made for her, no matter that it was the same stuff. Or maybe it was during one of the many random echoes of her father's nagging that would ring suddenly in her ears. Maybe it began the moment she first laid eyes on the neither large nor menacing looking Suho, or the moment he looked to her less like someone who would drive another person to kill themselves and more like the kind of coward who would go into hysterics upon witnessing a death. Maybe it was the moment she saw his filthy habit of spitting on the ground all the time just as she'd imagined he would or when she realized it was unfair to blame everything on him. Or maybe it began after she'd felt the unfamiliar thrill that comes only when you amplify your malice. Truth is, all of it was the starting point. Those scattered moments had somehow converged, each point forming a line that surrounded Seo to reach this current moment. For Seo, evil intent was like a weapon that was simultaneously cold yet hot, hard yet soft, blunt yet sharp, heavy yet light. Her heart would boil as hot as a blast furnace than cold ice, a rapidly increasing cycle spurred on by the core of that malice. Sayo's bad intention was the hammer she'd found in number 157. If she were to put it to use, it would be for its blunt force. She hadn't known at first what she might use it for, but the hammer had found its own use. To keep herself from immediately wielding it, she sometimes had to convince herself that time was not quite right but the opportunity was coming, and not long now. If she were to swing that hammer, there was no question that she would aim for the brain. It was the perfect target for a single strike. As organs go, the brain had such a high rate of fatality. It was much more likely to result in immediate death than a blow to the heart. Of course, she could aim elsewhere, like the back or chest, whose larger surface areas offered a higher probability of not missing, or the arms or legs, which she could still easily hit while swinging wildly. Even if all she did was put him in a hospital bed for a month, that would, that would be enough. Assuming, of course, that she'd be content with only breaking a few veins or capillary, capillaries, certainly not if her intention was to kill. The brain's surface area is equal to about a single sheet of newspaper and takes up no more than 2% of the total body weight, or about 1.5 kilograms. That small organ can control a person who stands over 170 centimeters tall. It tells them to eat, to take the bus, to hold a grudge, to hate, and to make decisions both monumental and trivial that change their lives. It cheats and lies and placates and clings. It threatens and blackmails and violates and commands. It fills a man's mind with thoughts of death and compels him to take his own life. 
Carbon monoxide or even just too much cigarette smoke attacks the brain first, damaging the tissue by depriving it of oxygen. The brain is particularly vulnerable to heat. As Seo struggle to imagine the agony of a brain, a body, a home, a world being wrapped in flames, she tightened her grip on the hammer. Her task was clear, to bring the hammer down hard on something. Shh! The air made a vicious sound as the hum- hammer punched through it. That sound alone had enough force to rattle a brain. A few more practice swings, and Seo knew that raising her arm overhead and bringing it down fast and hard generated the most force. But to aim for his brain, she would have to be taller than Suho. She wasn't, which meant that a single blow would not be fatal. Suho would fight back hard against this unexplained attack. She would have to swing the hammer and run like hell, or else find herself caught. After watching Suho come out of the debtor's house and spit on the ground again, Seo turned to head for the subway station. Soon she heard him behind her, then he was overtaking her, his pace much faster than hers. She lost him in the crowd of commuters heading home. She'd grown careless, having been to the same location several times before. But she had her guesses as to where he'd go next. The row of restaurants along the main road. He was a regular there. She checked one after the other, no sign of him. Following him was one thing, but guessing when he was hungry or what he wanted to eat was another entirely. She headed back towards the station and spotted him. He was sitting in a noodle shop, staring blankly at the television mounted to the wall, waiting for his food. It was the first time he'd gone to that particular restaurant. Finding him this time, it had nothing to do with the statistics or probabilities that she'd calculated from her painstaking observations. It was just dumb luck. Realizing that made her want to end it now. Why drag it out any longer when she could just bash him over the head with the hammer she kept in her bag as he was exiting the restaurant? It would happen so fast he'd be unable to defend himself. It wasn't unusual to be attacked by a complete stranger in a crowded place. But she couldn't. This task, it was akin to an inevitability or a duty. She had to curb her impulses until the time was right. A mere impulse could not possibly contain all of the fury and hatred that she felt. She would find a better method than the hammer, and she would gladly keep company with malice until she did. Malice gave Seo something to do. It swept away her grief and lifted her out of bed in the morning. It gave her energy and got her moving. It fed her and kept her going from place to place instead of lying in bed all day. It enabled her to live simply and without complaints in the cramped Koshiwan room barely big enough to hold a twin bed and a small desk. It helped her endure the hot nights in that windowless room where she would lay still so as not to make a sound. It got her through the hours spent never talking to another soul, and it kept her from returning to the ashes of number 157. Seo left Suho at the restaurant and walked slowly back to the station. There was only one entrance. If she hid among the crowd, she could wait for him unseen and ride back on the subway with him. She was not alone. No matter the time or place, Suho was with her. Sometimes she thought about attacking Suho so much that she wondered if it hadn't already happened. She had trouble distinguishing between it and things that had actually taken place. It was the future, and yet it felt like the past. The way she saw it in her mind was so concrete and clear and detailed that she questioned whether she was truly picturing something that hadn't happened or was, in fact, recalling something that had. She did this despite it being based on speculation and wild leaps rather than known facts or self-evident cause and effect. The very lack of logic or validation had dug in deep. Seo was way past being able to tell the difference. Thank you. And that's the law of lines coming out spring, (laughs) April 2020. Um, The second excerpt, uh, it's a very short excerpt uh, that I'll read. And I chose it just to sort of change up the mood since that was a little bit dark. This is from a book that was published last year called The Plotters. The paperback edition just came out. Um, And this is uh, from a chapter, oh, I guess to explain, if you're not familiar with the book, it's the main character, Rei Sing, is, so the idea of the book is that everything in Korea is controlled by these plotters who plot assassinations. Uh, And they direct the course of of history in Korea that way. And Rei Sing is one of these assassins, these hired guns. and the book, as all good assassina- assassin stories go, starts with him discovering that he is now a target. Uh, and in this chapter, titled Beer Week, um, I'll, I'll just start, it's called Beer Week. 
Racing cracked open a can of beer. 7.30 in the morning. The alleys lined with four-story red brick apartment blocks were jammed with people heading off to work. Racing opened his window and lit a cigarette. The weather was strange. Weak rays of sunlight filtered down from one side of the sky, while a light rain fell from the other. Actually, the rain wasn't so much falling as flying around. The morning commuters in iron suits scowled up at the sky, unsure whether to open their umbrellas. Racing took another gulp of beer in honor of those who had to go to work and weather the strange. You might not think of beer as a breakfast drink, but in fact, it's perfect. If knocking back a can of beer after a hard day's work makes you feel refreshed, rewarded, and relaxed, then a can of beer in the morning is about feeling melancholic, fuzzy-headed, improper, and refusing to act like a responsible adult just because the sun's come up. Racing loved the feeling of irresponsibility that came with drinking beer for breakfast. The same irresponsibility that turned his sarcasm inward as he gazed out his window and thought, look at all of you, living life to the fullest. As for my life, to hell with it. Racing took another swig. Guzzling beer while watching people go to work filled his head with surreal images. He pictured himself lying dead in a coffin and debating what to eat for dinner. Dead in a coffin, but his stomach growling as loudly as ever. How could this be? How on earth could a corpse be hungry? Dead racing was starving, but no one brought him any food. The funeral guests were all talking about him. He really was a piece of shit, wasn't he? Yep, complete asshole. It didn't stop. I know it's not right to say this in front of the deceased, but honestly, he was such a prick. To hear a kid his age use pun liar to people so much older than him, and he never even thanked me for anything I did for him. It was Bear's voice. Racing wished he could punch Bear in the back of the head for talking shit about him, but he couldn't. He was a corpse. Racing finished his cigarette, lit up another, and swallowed an aspirin with a mouthful of beer. Aspirin, cigarette, beer. The inside of his head was heavy and hazy, as if an enormous bank of fog had rolled in. At least once a year, anxiety would swoop down on him for no reason and his mood would crash. Whenever that happened, Racing started his mornings with a can of beer. He stayed indoors, turned on some music, curled up on the windowsill like a snail and drank beer all day. Racing drained the can and crumpled it, then tossed it onto his desk, next to the other two he'd finished. Sitting beside the crumpled cans was the bomb he'd found inside his toilet. Racing picked it up. It was smaller than a box of matches, so dainty that it had filled him with relief of the what harm could this little thing do variety. But the owner of the meat market hardware shop had taken one look at it and set him straight. Where'd you say the bomb was? In my toilet. This would have blown your ass off. That tiny thing? The pressure's higher inside a toilet bowl. It's like squeezing a firecracker in your hand when it goes off. Basically, when you sit down to take a shit, your ass forms a seal over the hole, creating the perfect conditions for this bomb to do maximum damage. Are you saying it could have killed me? Ever seen anyone survive without an ass? So it wasn't just a threat or a warning. Not if it had gone off. But it's hard to say if it would have. I've, I've never seen one of these before. It's waterproofed really well and has a unique chemical fuse that can sense when you take a shit. The amount of explosives is perfectly calculated to take your ass off, but it might be a dud. Hard to say. Though I can tell it was made by an amateur because pros don't make the wiring this complicated. There's no point. The owner held the bomb up to the light to examine it again. It's really ingenious, he exclaimed. Who would make a bomb this cute? N none of the guys I know is this creative. I'd love to meet this person. Racing scowled. He'd run errands for the shop since he was 12, which means he'd known the owner for 20 years. And yet, the guy didn't so much blink an eye at the thought of racing dead with his ass blown off, or at the tragic fact that racing might be on a plotter's list. To him, racing was no different from his countless other regulars who'd ended up neutralized. Anyway, I assume this isn't the work of the government, Racing asked. Hard to say. Nowadays, there are so many hired guns, companies, and plotters that no one can keep track. What'd you do? I can't count the reasons I should be dead by now. I've been in this business for 15 years, after all. Racing held out his hand, meaning the shop owner should shut up and give it back already. Well, looks like you survived this one, the owner said, handing back the deactivated bomb. Yeah, hooray for constipation. working okay great um so 
Right now the time is 7.30, okay. I've been instructed to go for about 25 minutes. I don't want to get in trouble here. Okay, um, so I thought I would actually just start by telling a short story, a quick story um, about how I met Sora uh, over 10 years ago, and then try to kind of tie it up um, with some of the themes that um, I would like to introduce. Um, obviously, we don't have to pursue them if Sora doesn't want to pursue them, but just keep it out there. And also, actually, it relates back to um, this workshop, so I thought it would be useful. So over 10 years ago, I had just finished uh, my MFA program, um, MFA program um, in creative writing. And I was thinking, well, now what? What do I do now? Um, and one of the things I actually had lined up was uh, a translation fellowship um, in Seoul. So I flew to Seoul and was going to be there for about a year. Um, it was the first time going back as an adult for me, so it was a big experience. And Brother Anthony of Thais at the time, who had graciously answered my email, which was like, dear Brother Anthony, can you help me become a translator? He's like, sure, <laughs> why don't you come um, meet up with me? And then he actually introduced me to Sora. And Sora had been in Korea at the time already for, for a few years, 2007, for a few years? Five years already. Okay, so already five years, wow. Okay, now that's why you were so good already. So that's how I met her. And, and um, that was 2007, and I spent a year kind of translating and meeting up with people like Sora and other translators and, and learning more about translation and Korean literature. And then I came back to um, New York and then I was like, now what? <laughs> and um, I was feeling kind of meandering and then I figured I had some free time because I was still on the fellowship getting some money from the fellowship. And I thought I should just volunteer some time at, at, at AAWW. Um, and actually this, um, it wasn't this location, it was a different location. And Ken Chen, who was the director at the time, um, said, sure, why don't you come, come by? So I, I came, I went, and um, he said, uh, we had a conversation, and he asked me what I was interested in. And it was this amazing, and some of you already may know Ken Chen, and it was an amazing conversation where almost everything I mentioned about things that I felt was very marginal to kind of um, mainstream society in terms of what it meant to be Korean, Korean American, what it meant to be translating, writing fiction, and all that. And you know, Ken is not Korean American. I mean, he's of you know, Chinese diaspora, but he's not Korean American. But he got everything. So it was this feeling that I didn't have to translate. It was this amazing feeling that everything I said was already kind of, he picked up on it. Um, and that was happening in a space just like this one. And he said, well, if you have so much free time, why don't you help me paint these walls? So he actually recruited me to paint the walls of um, AAWW. And that was a different place. And then now I'm you know, here. And it's amazing to see all these people um, come together around uh, a theme like translation, um, led by someone who's been so productive and, and, and amazing um, for for the field of translation. Um, and I, I, I guess, I guess the thing that I want to raise about translation here is, often translators are talked about as figures that are invisible, um, that are that their primary role is to to bridge, to take one kind of um, unit of culture and link it to another unit of culture. And, and there's some legitimacy to that, that description, and I think it does do some work. But I think it also does the disservice of, again, erasing the translator's identity. And, and I think there's something about translation that's not, not just translation, but trans translating, that's not something that's marginal at all. That's something that's quite universal. That's something that's quite everyday. And I would venture to say that many of you in this room would feel that. Um, to the bone, this idea that um, many of us have grown up with other other languages around us, even if it's not English. Um, I teach at Rutgers, and vast majority of my students have grown up in bilingual, perhaps even trilingual households. So even if they're not masterful speakers of the other languages, they're used to hearing other languages. They're constantly transiting, constantly transiting. So as universal as the act of storytelling is for all of us, even if we're not masterful writers, we all tell stories, right? I would venture to say that Trans we are all translators in, in some, some way or form, and, and there's something um, universal about that. So um, again, I think that one thing that I would like to suggest is instead of again, thinking about translating as a bridge or a link, that perhaps it's a, it's a way of thinking about space and community and bringing people together that perhaps feel like they don't belong, and I think um, this is a great place to kind of throw that idea out there, and perhaps we can pursue this um, during our conversation in some, some way or form or even during the Q&A. Um, once we were done talking. Um, but I thought also uh, this would be a good way of introducing the book that um, Sora participated in, and you, you didn't translate for this, right? I didn't, 
I did not. I did do some editing. Okay. I think your mic is, is it? Oh, is this? Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm just holding it too far. Uh, it's not working. Is it working? Way at the end? Ah, there you go. Okay. All right. So, could you just talk about the book a little uh, bit? Yeah, so I, I guess it was last year, a year or two ago. Uh, this anthology came out uh, just last year, Mixed, Koreans, Mixed Korean R Stories. Um, I had seen the, there was a flyer that went out like a year before the book came about uh, asking for Mixed Korean, I guess Mixed Korean Americans, but Mixed Koreans of it, whatever, uh, nationality to submit personal essays talking about whatever aspect of being mixed uh, they wanted to talk about. And I had it like on my computer desktop planning to write something. And of course I didn't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then like a year later um, on Facebook, another announcement came up about the book. They were looking for help with editing. They needed somebody who could read Korean. And uh, because some of the, con many of the contributors had included Romanized Korean uh, in their essays and they would wanted somebody to just sort of fact check and make sure that the spelling was okay, that the wording was okay, not to sort of correct their Korean, which wasn't always uh, accurate, big scare quotes around that word. Um, and so I was like, perfect. I wanted to do something around this book, and so I jumped at that chance. Um, and while editing it, they gave me a second chance to also write an essay for it. Um, and uh, so uh, I guess I sh should probably talk about the essay that I wrote for sure, it. Sure. Uh, it's a very personal essay. Um, my mother had passed away quite recently, and I was really in that just the throes of processing her death and and uh, trying to find the words for it. Um, and so I just sat down and just let it all come out on the page and cleaned it up as best as I could and sent it off. And and yeah, that's kind of the story of that. So the essays, the piece that I have in there, it, it, the first part of it talks about uh, my relationship to Korean and the idea basically that I, what I open with is the fact that for me, uh, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be bilingual. I wanted to speak Korean, um, uh, but it wasn't, so m my mother's Korean, my father is white. We grew up uh, on military bases in the move to California and it just was not, we weren't immersed in a Korean community. There wasn't enough language support outside of the home to make bilingualism possible. So she did what she could. She tried, um, but it just never quite happened. And then later in life, I, I, um, it, that desire never went away. And so in college, the first chance I had to take Korean classes, I took them um, and went to considerable lengths to acquire the language skills that I have. And yet despite all that, my mother and I never spoke to each other in Korean. I mean, I shouldn't say never. We did occasionally, but it was always these very faltering, difficult conversations that mostly, mostly just ended up being about food. <laughs> and not even like complex, just like, Mogoni, Masisa, Ne. Yeah, and, and then, so that's the first part of the essay. And then the second, second half uh, is, uh, uh, yeah, goes into her actual passing, which I'll, not go into detail about or I'll need a tissue. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, maybe this would be a good way of segueing into thinking a little bit about how you began as a translator um, when you've started f when you started feeling like you actually were beginning to hit your stride. Um, what were some initial challenges that you were facing um, as a translator? Um, and I know from your um, other interviews that you've done that um, initially um, your ambition was to right in some capacity, and I know that you've published poetry. Um, so it would be interesting to hear, you know, how that transition occurred for you. Yeah, I, it's, it, I, I've joked sometimes that I kind of just fell into it or that it happened to me. Um, I, I don't know that I even had a concept of translation as a career. I knew that books somehow got moved into other languages, um, but I did never really thought about it. And I, yeah, I was living in Korea trying to sort of do the bohemian thing of work as little as possible to cover the rent and then, you know, write my whatever great thing I was going to write, which somehow never quite happened. But for fun, and this was, you know, I'd acquired enough Korean to, to be able to read 
uh, novels. Um, and I kept reading novels, that, reading stuff that I just thought, oh, this would be really good. This would work in English. Like I would pick up a book and sort of start hearing it in English in my head and then, and then find out that it hadn't been translated. And so that was sort of starting to spark an interest of like what books could work. I was also working as an editor, um, editing very dry academic papers uh, from Korean, or that had been translated from Korean, and that occasionally would require me to go back to the Korean and sort of figure out what had happened in the translation in order to make it work in English. And so both of these, really all three things, it was the, the, my job and then mm. the, just my own past. I'm just having fun reading and then that underlying desire to write that sort of converged to, uh, to make it happen. And then the big, the big step was, so in Korea, one of the ways you debut as a translator is you, you do a contest. And so I did the Korea Times translation contest for poetry and to my surprise, I, I won. And I was, so I was like, hmm, okay, okay. <laughs> Perhaps this is something. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty much, yeah, how it came about. Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I was curious about also was that because you you actually have published your own poetry, um, is there kind of a feedback loop process um, in terms of your how you work as a translator and how what you gain from that experience actually feeds back into your creative process? Yes, but not always in a good way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, even earlier today, I was talking about how certain writers, I find their voices in, infecting my writing. And sometimes I like it. Sometimes I'm just puzzled by it. Um, Pyeon Hae Young is one writer who I, I find mm. she sneaks in now uh, when I try to write. Um, it, but to be honest, it was kind of difficult. Like I went into it thinking that it, translating would help me be a better writer, that it would be like, and I've talked about this in other interviews, that it'd be like reverse engineering, right? Like the idea is if you want to know how to make a radio, you take an existing radio and you take it apart, figure out how the pieces go together, and then you put it back together. Or you make your own radio from other parts. And I kind of had this idea that translation would be like that, that I would translate a certain number of stories and come out of it writing my own stories. And it really didn't work. It backfired spectacularly on me where I became so self-conscious about every word I put on the page that I kind of lost that, oh, this is so bleak, I'm sorry. I kind of like momentarily lost that flow, that mm. zone that you get into when you write, where you're not thinking so much about what you put on the page. So that was kind of a, a weird experience for me as, certainly as a beginning translator, was uh, just that hyper awareness of, of language on the page. It serves you well as a translator, not so much as a writer, right? Because you kind of need that spark at some point. You do talk about how you get into the zone sometimes when you're translating and you can just go for like an eight hour session. And I yeah. wonder, <laughs> you know, like writers talk about the zone too. Um, and John Gardner famously talks about the vivid and continuous dream that yes. fiction writers have to try to um, produce basically for the reader. And, and I mean, again, my limited experience with translation, I've had these instances where I, I kind of get into the zone where I can translate pages and pages and pages and not all of it is great, but yeah. it ain't bad either. Like yeah. you can go back and fix it, and it's it's fine. So I mean, that's kind of like getting into the zone. How do you how do you describe that experience? Is it something akin to writing, um, writing on your own? I or? I would say so, and I think I, like now that you bring that up, I, I I think it is similar to when I wrote poetry. So for me, one of my big challenges as a writer, whether it was poetry or or fiction, it was always structure. Like. I loved just playing with words uh, and images and just letting everything be very free form, sort of mess on the page. Um, and when I would take writing classes, the comments I always got were like, structure, like this needs a form, this mm. needs something. And with translation, it's kind of glorious because the form is there for you. All you have to do mm. is follow it. And you can have as much fun with the words on the page, but it's, it's there. And so it's, it's probably really dangerous for someone like me because it really makes it easy not to write. <laughs> I've heard other translators describe it as kind of like performing music. Would you say that's similar? I have like zero knowledge or experience of music, but yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, let's get into the more kind of gritty, nitty and gritty um, aspects of translations. I think um, 
because again, translators are so invisible. Some of you may know that you know U.S. publishers actually prefer not to include translate translator names on their on their um, cover co covers because they want to kind of convey the sense of seamless transition. Sorry, tr seamless transmission from the authorial genius to the reader's mind. Um, and you actually have to get to a certain level of accomplishment, as Sora obviously has, to have have your name start to appear in these translations. Um, so um, there are all sorts of factors conspiring to um, continue and maintain the invisibility of the translator. So I think one way of pushing back against that is to talk about the process. You know, um, I think many people don't necessarily know about the editorial process, the kind of collaboration that happens um, quite naturally between author and translator, if you could speak to that a bit. Yeah, and actually to go back to the idea of the thing about the name on the cover, some of it is accomplishment, that you get to a certain level where you can demand it. I've actually never demanded it. I've been lucky that I've gotten to work with publishers who have either worked with translators before or who have their own uh, uh, progressive or activist idea about translation and making it visible. And not all of the books that I've done had my name on the cover. I, admittedly, there are times where I feel a little sorry to the author because I have this long hyphenated name. <laughs> 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 and it's like, no matter how they change the font, it's always sort of overpowering. But I guess I shouldn't really worry about that. But the process, um, but going back to that, uh, what I would say about the process that I think is not very well understood is how collaborative it is. I think there's this perception that as translators, so there's the author's authority, but then there's also a strange sense of authority that's put on us as translators where everything that happens in the translation from the title to like, did we include the author's note that was in the original to every single word choice on the page and like, why did you use this idiom? Why did you use that word? It all comes back to us as like, why did you do that? But the thing is, and not to sound like I'm, you know, we're dodging responsibility, sometimes it's not us. Sometimes it's an editor, sometimes yeah. it's, it's an agent. Agents can step in and, and, and weigh in on things like titles, how they want things to read. Sometimes the author themselves will, uh, will have a say. Um, and so while the bulk of the work is certainly us, there's really so much behind the scenes that is not visible. Yeah. Um, and so there's, it's, it's a bit of a, a I don't know what the, I can't think of the term now, but like the, the visibility of the translator is fantastic, but it sometimes is sort of like we're being pushed, mm. like, here, here, take the arrows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, can you think of an a example of a positive oh, outcome yeah. <laughs> where the collaboration <laughs> yielded something pretty Honestly, cool? I love the editors that I've worked with. It, I lean on them as much as I can. Um, it's so helpful. Uh, <clears throat> So many translators talk about feeling alone, especially when you're starting out, because mm. you're just, yeah. Um, but once you're into that stage of publishing, and it's not every publishing house, uh, editors have different levels of involvement. Um, but when I've worked with publishing houses where they are really supportive and giving me lots of feedback, that's where I find that I make these leaps where I, I grow as a translator, because you really need that feedback as you're working. So like one example is uh, the plotters. Um, I gripe about it, but I also really enjoyed the, the experience. So The Plotters by Kim Ansu. It was initially published in Australia, uh, and the editor there, Penny Houston, she was fantastic. She's a translator herself, uh, and she had read the book in French. So she had just so much knowledge that she was bringing to it, and she worked really closely with me on, it felt like every sentence, and uh, really tightening up the prose uh, beyond uh, in ways that I, you know, beyond what I had imagined for the book. Um, and so then it got published, and then at some point during that process, it was sold to the U.S. and the U.K., uh, and the U.S. editor took the book and did his own edit, which included lots of feedback for the writer, including structural edits, like, who's this back character? Can we develop him more? Mm. The ending seems a little clipped. Could you make it a little longer? <laughs> What's this historical reference? Can we flesh this out? And it almost became another translation of the book to the extent that there are actually two versions of the same book. So there's the Australian, which is, uh, it's basically how the, the book was published in Korea. And then there's the US edition, which has uh, a longer ending and more detail throughout. And it was um, really fascinating to have, again, that feedback and, and to have him weighing in on what he thought readers could handle, what they would need more of. Um, yeah, yeah. I'll trail you. off there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
So another, I guess another question I have has to do with what you have observed um, change over time because you've been active for some time now. Would you say you're mid-career now? Are you mid-career? I think I'm mid-career. You're mid-career. <laughs> it's incredible. You're mid-career It happened really now. fast. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so 10 years ago, you know, Sora and I were sitting at a bar talking about the state of the field and there was, I mean, there's been, there'd been a lot of cr stuff translated, by the way. That's, yes. It's a myth to say that there weren't Korean translations before this generation. There were lots of it. It's just that a lot of it just kind of sank without a trace in terms right. of the market. Um, or just went right into libraries. Yeah, libraries and, and, yeah. and did great things for Korean studies and Asian studies and students had things to read, which is all great. But um, in terms of you know, how the critical establishment was viewing it and whether it was being discussed um, by the mainstream press, it just wasn't, right? It was sinking without a trace. So um, it really, this is a very new phenomena of the, the, Anglo, the Anglophone embrace of Korean literature. Um, and Insura obviously is playing a huge part in that. Um, so I guess a, a question I have is um, kind of as you, as you kind of hit your stride and you began, you kind of came to your own as a translator and you've now taken on several books, um, significant books um, at that. Um, what are some things that you've noticed change about how people respond to um, Korean literature, um, whether you're in Korea or, or abroad? The first thing that, just like what you're talking about, was the awareness of it, uh, that it went from like books going right into college libraries to being in Barnes and Noble. Um, what else can I say about that? I really, it's, I, we keep coming back to the word visibility. It's the visibility that has changed dramatically. Uh, like for me, I, I, there was one thing that always bugged me when the Korean literature was hitting this current, starting this current boom is it seemed like every time a book would come out, the reviews would talk about it as if it were the first book ever to be translated. And they would always use this term, opening the doors, which I apologize to LTI because I think that's actually one of their mottos, like opening the doors to Korean literature. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they've earned that. I mean, they do, they've done the work. But it was like, how can every single book be opening the door? Is the door not open now? Yeah if the book before opened it, like, is it a swinging door? What is this? You know? yeah, yeah. It, it really irked me. Um, where was I going to go with that? Sorry, I started a rant. <laughs> uh, but along with that, yeah, I'm really going to get lost. So I'll, no, it's okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, I could just chime in. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I would say that similar, similar occurrence happens with Asian American literature. Yes. That there's a kind yeah. of short-term memory where people yes. just forget about the last example of Asian American literature where they talked about it was a gate opening event and then yeah. And they forget about it, and then the new guy comes along. So that kind of amnesia is, is yes. kind of kind of dis, uh, demoralizing. It is. Why American? are we yeah. so forgettable? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think that there's kind of been a critical mass, not just in the arts world, but in terms of mass media, where there's more representation that has taken us away from that paradigm? I do, because there have been uh, two big prize winners. There was uh, Please Look After Mom, um, and then, of course, The Vegetarian. And I feel like those are like these huge springboards that really pushed um, awareness of Korean literature into different reading audiences, because those are very different books. Uh, and then there are lots of other books uh, along with that that didn't get as much attention, but helped to sort of push uh, awareness. Again, and it's into different audiences, so you have a, a broader swath of people mm -hmm. who are reading these books. And then along with that, of course, like Twitter, social networking, um, I think that's also made a big difference because you have these uh, sort of live conversations going on, on online and, of course, lots of reviews for better or worse. Uh, yeah. yeah. I hope it doesn't stop, but, I mean, always in the back of my mind, I'm like, because oh. we say Korean wave, right? But a wave, yeah. it's going <laughs> to break at some point. Yeah. <laughs> we need the next BTS, right? We do, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you find that when you're having conversations with editors about specific choices um, w regarding like cultural references or you know specific like food items or things like that um, there's less pushback when you want to kind of take a stand on yes actually absolutely I've, I've found uh, in a lot of ways uh, if I don't want words Rome uh, italicized if I want to keep the Korean uh, if I don't want it this is kind of very petty. If I don't want the Korean change to the equivalent Japanese word, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> gonna be, that one amuses me. Um, yeah, I find that they're very open to, yeah. to yeah, hearing me out on that. And like the, I, not italicizing, that was a really fun one that on like the last round of books, I was like, hey, what if we just leave it unmarked? 
just let it exist alongside the English. And they were already ahead of me on that. They were like, yeah, we've been talking about this. Uh, Very cool. Um, let's talk a little bit about teaching. So you teach okay. translation too. I taught translation. I've been taking a break. Oh, okay. Taking a break. <laughs> you want to talk about it? We can talk about it. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, just talk about the, I think, I don't, probably many people have no idea what right. teaching translation looks like. Workshop, workshop instructors for, for translation. If there are things that you've kind of picked up along the way, mm -hmm. things that you've observed. And, and, and as kind of um, related to that, um, you, um, there in your introduction, there was a, reference to a collective, a translation uh, yes. collective. If you could talk a little bit about the sense of community that comes from that, sure. what that's like. So teaching, I taught at two different institutions, uh, Iwa Women's University and the Literature Translation Institute of Korea. Um, but the classes were basically workshops. They were very much like writing workshops where you don't have a, a well, you ha kind of have a syllabus, you have a direction, but uh, you're not going in and saying, this is how to translate. You have, um, the students will bring in work, and then as a group, you're giving each other feedback. Um, and at L LTI, it's basically uh, the same, uh, except that with LTI, the focus is purely on literature, whereas the Women's University, we would do nonfiction and fiction. Um, and it, it, it's a really, it's an interesting experience to teach there because, and I teach in Korea, or I taught in Korea, and so not all of my students were uh, native, quote unquote, native English speakers. Most of them were uh, translating into their second languages. So it uh, raised really interesting challenges as far as uh, how and where I could push them with their translations and, to, and how to get them to think differently about translation, like really to get away from the idea that there is one correct translation or that their job as a student was to make me happy with their translation. Um, what I wanted from them was to just think about why were they translating it that way? Why did the writer write the book that way? Uh, why, you know, how is this different from other stories, other writers? Uh, and so that was what I really enjoyed about it was um, having those conversations and trying to push them to ask those questions. Are there any exercises that you feel have a palpable um, effect on improving their translations? Ooh, that's a hard one because it kind of takes years to see. Mm. <laughs> like uh, in the moment, I'm, it, I, and so, uh, one, uh, one of my, well, our shared mentors, Hyun Tung, had, had told me that, you know, when you teach, you're not teaching for right now, you're teaching, you're teaching uh, for who they're going to be years from now because nothing you teach them is going to sink in. It's going to take years. Um, that doesn't help with the student evaluations when no. that's a different kind of temporality. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of exercises, uh, I guess one thing I found useful was if we if they were translating a certain short story, I would try to find something in English that had something in common. And not content, but uh, something in the voice or the style or just the approach the writer was taking. And I would have them read that while they were translating the story in Korean, and I found that was probably the most helpful because it gave them uh, a direction to go in. So they weren't necessarily copying it, but they could see that this was possible in English, that it wasn't limited to the Korean, that, they, that there was a way to get there. Yeah. Mm, thank you. Um, I guess my last question before we shift gears to the Q&A um, has to do with more pop cultural translations. Okay. Um, I remember when, um, I guess when Korean dramas and movies start to really take off in Korea, one of my, um, one of my friends actually told me that he wanted to do a, st do a startup where he would transllate the, the subtitles. But now I think everybody just does, people just kind of volunteer to do it, right? Yeah, There's they'll like a do family. it online, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know whether he would have made any money out of that anyway. <laughs> but um, I, what do you think of that in terms of the quality? I mean, this is kind of more of an amateur kind of observation that, that you might have been indulging in. Um, as a consumer of popular culture that comes out of Korea, do you feel like the quality has improved? Of subtitles? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that's a loaded question. I, I, to be honest, I sometimes have to actively not read subtitles, even though you, can, you can't get away from it. Um, yes and no. I, I mean, there have been issues, right, with, with certain certain movies. But then, yeah. what I, th but. What has caught my attention lately is uh, like translation of song lyrics, which I feel like is really brave. Uh, mm. Like people on Twitter who, you know, are uploading their lyrics. There's something really sort of terribly vulnerable about 
putting your translation out there for people to read. And so mm-hmm. I think it's, I think it's awesome that, 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 um, yeah, that, that they're doing that and putting it out there for, for comment. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That Thank one. you so yeah. much. Uh, so should we just open it up for a Q and A from the audience? Hi, uh, thanks. It was really great to hear you read and speak. Um, I'm just curious about if you have any examples of the comparisons that you would give to your students, the passages you give them in English to go with the Korean. Sure. Okay. Well, one, uh, it's kind of an easy one because it's the uh, Pyeon Hae Young, the writer that I that that I read from. Um, with one of her stories in class, I had them read her next to Shirley Jackson um, because I wanted. She does something with tension in her work and where she takes these very mundane scenarios uh, and you feel a sense of dread even if nothing actually happens. Um, and so, and I think Shirley Jackson with some of her short fiction did something similar. Funnily enough though, my students did not see the, <laughs> the correlation at all. They were like, but her sentences are completely different. And I was like, okay, but the, the tone, the mood. Um, other than that, let me think, uh, there was, I'm, I'm going to forget the title of the Korean story. I know that I used a, a story by Annie Prue. I think it was called uh, maybe Lighthouses. Um, it's about women living in Wyoming. And I put that alongside a Korean story that was also uh, female sort of women living miserably in the countryside. And um, that was a fun one because they were kind of like, wow, like American women are sad too. <laughs> And so that was more like story and character. Like, but again, it was like, look, like this stuff is out there. Because even aside from sort of the craft of translation and writing, sometimes even the subject matter, people say, well, why would anybody want to read this outside Korea? Or this is too uniquely Korean, or this only happens in Korea. And so again, you have to show them that, no, 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 everybody's miserable. <laughs> this is why we write, right? Like, this is why we put the stories out there. So those are two off the top of my head. Um, what else? I, uh, I'd have to go back to my syllabuses to figure the others out. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, two questions. I think they're kind of related. One is, as a translator with this years of experience, do you have any saying in bringing a project to the editors and say, hey, here's a book that I would really love to do? And is there like one project that you would love to just do? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I've been kind of lazy. I lean a lot on the agents to do that work of, of shopping the work around. Um, but one uh, area that I've been interested in is um, like YA. Uh, there's this one book. So I like, as you can probably tell from the things I read, I like the sort of dark, scary, but funny uh, stories and there's one uh, it's like a children's horror novel <laughs> about a haunted library which it should be translated <laughs> so that would be that would be one that I think would either me or someone else if, if I think it would be a fun book to to see in English how did you feel about the American translation of the plotters versus the Australian translation uh, honestly, I really loved both equally. Uh, the American translation, well, the Australian one was fun because I'm obviously not Australian, and so there was a lot of Australian vocabulary that I had to just dress the editors on, and yeah, like words, I was like, how is that a word? But um, the U.S. one, honestly, it was, okay, so to be honest, when I got the edits, when I got the email from the editor, I thought, are you kidding me? I was also, uh, how pregnant was I? I was very pregnant uh, when these things came my way. And I was like, I have to retranslate this? Like, I'm, like, I'm getting ready to do something really horrible. Um, <laughs> but when, and the author too. So the, th- the funny thing about the author is that while uh, all of these edits and conversations were taking place, he was on a deep sea fishing voyage doing research for his next book. So he was not available <laughs> for consultation at all. I had to wait for him, for his boat to land in Fiji uh, and for him to get Wi-Fi on his phone so that we could like talk about, you know, edits. And he came off like all ready to start his new book. Um, and he got this horrible email that was like, by the way, can you rewrite this book that you wrote 10 years ago? And so I think I'm pretty sure his reaction was like far worse than mine. 
Um, but we both kind of landed in the same place. Like we looked at the edit, or the the feedback from the editor, and thought this is actually brilliant. This will be. Uh, th these are great suggestions. Um, and he admitted that he had felt a little like akawa, like a little like he had rushed the ending of the original a little bit. And so he, after the initial dismay of like, oh crap, I can't start my new book yet. Um, I think he appreciated uh, that opportunity to jump back into it. And I'm actually, I, I really like the new ending. I like both, but the, the new one is, um, it just gives you a little more to kind of chew on. So earlier on, both of you mentioned being in the zone yes. and spending eight hours translating, obsessing over one word, <laughs> half a dozen way to translate or, um, a certain sentence or phrase. So I teach um, literary criticism or uh, literature and translation at the Pratt Institute, and I also teach writing at Columbia. And a lot of students, you know, we, we talk about this issue of of the, 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 the translation as we're reading the piece. So one semester I, as I was teaching vegetarian, depending on the copy of the print, the first print, second print, so we're all, all on page 14 and we had very minor you know, you know, changes in our, in our editions. And so, and, you know, and I find myself you know, also spending hours translating one page. So w at, at a certain point you have to stop yourself and I'm gonna go with this <laughs> idiom and this uh, word. How, do you, how did you, you know, as you, know, you mentioned at the beginning, you overcame this as a beginning translator. How did you get over it and, and, and felt that this is the way I'm going to go? I didn't overcome it. I torment my editors by sending them changes at the last, really last, like I'll email them and say, has the book gone to print? No, can you make this change? Page 52, line 18, please just, can you just take that comma out because it's bugging me. I, I'm, I'm really working on it, but I, I, it's really... <laughs> I try to practice mindful letting go, but it's, it's, it's hard because you second guess. And especially with translation, you really, and this, I guess uh, Matt links up with teaching, because I try to tell my students this, you need distance. Like when you do that first draft, you're, you're too close to the Korean. You can't see what's happening in the English yet. You need to get away from it uh, and have time to just read the English as a book in English. Um, and for me, I do my best to schedule that in, but invariably when I'm getting final proofs, like before the book, when they've got it all in PDF and it's ready to go, I feel like that's when I start seeing everything that I want to change. So it's, it, it is a work in progress. Um, it, and it's just, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's ultimately it's just acceptance. You just put you know, the keyboard down and say, okay, I, I am out of time. So I will say it's just deadlines. It, it, I have deadlines now, <laughs> and that's what enables me to just walk away from it. Yeah. Last question. Thank you for this talk. Um, I was wondering about the, the triple translation that you did with, um, well, I guess I'm calling it triple, but when you're talking to the translator in Australia and she read it in French, um, I'm taking a French translation course, and I'm also interested in like Korean translation, so it's like a triple thing. Um, I was wondering how it helped you like with her insights because French and Korean linguistically are pretty, uh, they come from different historical backgrounds. Yes. So it's just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it helped me in two ways. One, uh, just in terms of, so one of the biggest challenges with the plotters was uh, really figuring out the voice. I, when I first read it, I had a very clear idea in my head of what the book sounded like, what racing sounded like, but getting that onto the page, as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's, it's, that's the struggle, right? Like, how do I get this thing I hear in my head to appear on the page and sound the same to other people? Um, and there were parts where, especially with his humor, where she would kind of come in, the editor would come in and say, okay, well, the French translator sort of spun it this way, or it's a little bit drier, or it's a little bit more tongue-in-cheek, or more profane, or whatever, in the French. And so then that would, it sort of gave me permission to go back and change what I had done, or gave me clarity to say, okay, this is how this can look. The other thing is it also gave me the opportunity to push back and challenge her, because there were times where she would say, the French says this, and then I would go, well, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's not what I'm reading. And then uh, sometimes I'd run to the author and say, okay, well, what did this, what did you mean by this? Um, so it was good uh, in both ways. It, it, it was the support I needed to help understand uh, what he was doing in the book with his writing. 
Um, and if, if you've read it in Korean, he's, he put so many details, he put so much in that to tease all of it out and then, you know, put it, make it work in English, it, it was a, a really beautiful challenge. Um, but then also to sort of find my own backbone as a translator and to say, no, no, this is, the tra this is what I'm going to stand by. This is how I read it. You know, sorry, French translator, but I disagree. <laughs> Um, and I really think you need both. You need to listen, but you also, at some point, have to just stand up for for what you for the work you've done. All right. Thank you so much. Yay. Give Sora a round of applause.